Welcome to the November 89 edition of Directions, AT&T's all-employee video magazine. Coming up, AT&T rallies to reconnect Charleston, South Carolina after the worst hurricane in memory. Scientists are using AT&T's Pixel Machine to visualize the unknown. Legislation means office automation at the Massachusetts House of Representatives. AT&T athletes win big at the National Corporate Track Championships. And we look back at some of your favorite Direction stories. This is Directions, AT&T's video magazine. And they say that it's moving on a little more of a northwesterly track than it was earlier this afternoon. On Thursday, September 21st, AT&T South Carolina prepared to ride out the worst storm in the state's 300-year history, Hurricane Hugo. Our story focuses on business communication systems, just one of the dedicated groups who would work through the storm and its aftermath. We started that Thursday morning. We were all pretty apprehensive. We were all getting a little bit scared as Hugo was coming closer. We uh, called all of our accounts. We suggested that they cover their uh, telephone systems with some type of protective covering in the event that the roof might blow off. No longer can you get on I-26 to get to Columbia because it's backed up all the way from Columbia. She says she was kind of panicky, didn't know exactly what they should do, but they were expecting about four feet of water in their equipment room. So I suggested that one thing they could do, since they have a modular system 75. Unplug it from the outlet, cut the ground wires, and move it upstairs. Put it on a freight elevator and move it upstairs. Knowing that the storm was approaching us, uh, we began to uh, get supplies in. We were uh, had some stuff come in from Columbia. We had uh, stockpiles of uh, telephone instruments. They tried to elevate the switch, but could not do that, so they wrapped it in plastic from underneath. The police department is 24 hours a day. They cannot miss a lick. Communications to them is, is life. The day before the storm, Jim was over here, Jim Bishop, and we talked about what to do in the equipment room. I said, when we lose our telephones, he says, well, when the water gets to this level, it's going to hit this piece of equipment, and, it, and it's going to take it out no matter what you do. It's going to take them out then. We taped, we sandbagged, we lifted up as much equipment as we could possibly lift up. But all the preparation in the world couldn't have got us ready for this. We just never expected it. It was, it was worse than our worst nightmare. It was a horrible thing. You wish you were somewhere else. It was around 10 minutes after 12, we had a window blow out. We were in the long distance toll building. The wind was whipping through the building 120 miles an hour, blowing papers and trash cans around. We were servicing our customers. But in the back of your mind, you really wondered whether everything you owned had been lost. All the communications we had were by telephone. That's what we had. Everything else went out. Our radios went out. Everything went out. The telephone stayed on. We had people calling us during the storm. And they're saying, you got to come get me. And we told them, there's nothing we can do now. It's too late. No one can leave. 135 mile an hour winds, you can't even stand up in it. Debris flying everywhere. Glass shards everywhere. Uh, so. They just had to hold on. And sometimes that's all they needed to hear was us telling them to stay where you're at and uh, it's, everything's going to be all right. In a matter of six hours, one hurricane did more damage to the Charleston area than all the previous disasters in its 300 plus year history. The losses in Charleston uh, in the Charleston area at this point in time have been estimated to be between four and five billion dollars. Probably more importantly, the psychological damage to the residents of Charleston. Tremendous personal loss. Uh, virtually no family was unscathed by some, some form of damage, and uh, it'll be years in, in rebuilding. Here at the Medic University, we estimate that we had somewhere in excess of 70 million dollars worth of damage, and our institution Telephone-wise, and System 85 was fully operational during the entire storm. We never lost service. We never lost uh, the ability to communicate. People have come to us since then and said, if I had not been able to communicate with somebody else, another living person, another living body, I don't know what I would have done during that, during that hurricane. 
to go through a storm of this magnitude and still have telephones is unheard of. It was the only utility that survived. I have three System 75s. I have the one at the county police department, which got a little damp, and it never stopped. It's more than just the switch. It's the service behind the switch. I think today we know we're in an age where technology has really advanced, but the technology is only as good as the service. If you want a switch that's going to stay up and operate, and you want the people that's going to be there inside that room when that storm is eating you up outside, you need to look at AT&T very seriously and those System 85. We put a full page advertisement in yesterday's uh, paper here in Charleston, and we listed about 25 groups that were pointed out during this storm as being here when the chips were really down and you needed them. And in our top 10 was uh, our AT&T telephone technicians. Uh, they were here. They were working, uh, they left their homes and their families, and they were devoted enough to this institution and AT&T to be here when we needed them to make everything work. Suggesting the inexorable march of time, these bizarre figures are the creations of a fertile imagination and an extraordinary computer. Named the Pixel Machine, its output not only entertains, but enlightens in the cause of science. This 3D reconstruction of medical imaging data reveals vital blood vessels deep inside the brain. Soon, such images could help doctors save lives. Even the abstract realm of mathematics is rendered visible, yielding forms that are mysteriously beautiful. Though certainly striking, such pictures are, in fact, the bread and butter of AT&T Pixel Machines, an independent business venture of AT&T operating from Somerset, New Jersey. Just three years after startup, the new company is beginning to ride the waves of success. The Pixel Machine is a unique computer compared to AT&T's other computers. For one thing, it's focused on a very specific marketplace. We're focused on high-performance graphics and image processing, and the users of those technologies tend to be scientists and research. Now they can present images of their data that makes it very clear and gives us insight into their data as to what they're trying to prove and show. The University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Here, scientists from around the nation and abroad interact in a unique interdisciplinary environment. Bringing them together is the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, a leader in the rapidly emerging field of scientific visualization. Now we have scientists that are using computers as their telescopes, as their laboratories. They're setting up the experiment now in the computer. And the only way that they can see the results is through the visualization process with computer graphics. Employing the full imaging power of the Pixel machine, computer artist Donna Cox helps engineer Richard Elson of the Eastman Kodak Company visualize the fluid dynamics of molten plastic. Here it's shown filling up a steel mold for a 35 millimeter film spool. The multicolored shapes depict the forces pushing the plastic, how hot it is, and where it's flowing. Such computer simulations promise to accelerate the design and manufacture not only of film spools, but a host of everyday products. The savings to both industry and consumers could indeed be substantial. I think the whole visualization process allows us to probe the universe where we've never been able to probe before. But through visualization techniques, we can now understand and, and see the invisible. There's a major transformation going on in the sciences right now as a result of being able to use animation and videotapes to communicate results to peers. This opens up a whole new area for communications. And in fact, visualization is essentially an extension of the communications process. The Pixel machine has really been the first machine of a new generation, a generation of machine where to produce graphics is so easy and so simple and so rapid that we really have disposable graphics. Beautiful. And having them being interactively created images, we can always direct ourselves to what's interesting at a particular moment. You're not stuck because there's a chip in there that will only process graphical information the way that was written onto that chip. But with the Pixel machine, you have the flexibility to load in your own routines and to do your own graphics work and do graphics the way that you want to do graphics. 
The Pixel machine is based upon the DSP32, which is an AT&T chip. And in fact, you may know it as the one that's in the telephone switching lines. What we've done is we've incorporated, uh, in some cases, up to 82 of these inside the machine at any one time. Heading AT&T Pixel Machines since its founding in 1986, Kathy Sullivan particularly values the dedication of her staff. Most of us are very excited about what we do in our job. And I think the reason is because we have a sense of building something from scratch. And I think the uh, thrill and the enjoyment comes from having built it, feeling we really do own it. We've created it and the team that we have here. We have a wonderful team of people who are really excited about what they're doing, and that's important to me. What excites me most about this work is being able to get access to these absolutely remarkable images. And I really do believe that these images represent a convergence of art and science. When you think of the excitement that astronomers must have had when they knew that they had just built the biggest telescope, and now they were the first person to peep through the eyepiece, I think we feel the same kind of excitement because we know that we can bring out what's important to us in our own work. We can actually look into the science and understand the physics in a way that no one else can because we have the biggest telescope. House will be in order. Members will kindly take their seats. Mr. Speaker, the issue before us today is local aid. Speaker, we have this bill downstairs, and we are looking at this bill as we are looking at many bills, Mr. Speaker. Located in Boston, the Massachusetts House of Representatives is unlike any other state government. Eight to 10,000 pieces of legislation are filed each year. However, as recently as 1985, the House was still using typewriters for word processing. The few computers they did have couldn't communicate. So when the House selected AT&T to provide a computer system, it was because we knew how to integrate their existing computers into a unified office automation and budgeting system. Well, it's always a hectic environment because the normal process of government in a democracy is to operate by crisis. The quick and short answer to that is kill the bill, because the bill clearly stinks. <laughs> it's beyond redemption, it's beyond salvation, it's beyond explanation. The rewriting of legislation was taking days. The only concession the House had made uh, in the area of word processing uh, in comparison to the Stone Age was to adopt some memory typewriters. That was it. These people here don't need to be computer literate. They need to do what they're good at, and that is to create laws for the protection of the, of the state's residents. When the system was sold, it was sold through not the technology, but how they can use the system and how it can help them. Good morning, Speaker Kavamian's office. The workload in the Massachusetts state legislature is second only to the United States Congress. The question is, how do we manage it? One of the real advantages to me as the Speaker's legislative director is not to have to pick up the phone and call another office to find the status of a bill. The Speaker could call me, ask me what's going on with a piece of legislation. I have that at my fingertips by virtue of this terminal on my desk. The ability to have this information at their fingertips is due to networking. Prior to AT&T, the House had computers from Wang, Digital, and IBM, but they couldn't communicate with each other. AT&T's networking allows our computers to talk to each other as well as to computers made by other companies. Before the computer, I would do this on the typewriter. And as the session moved along, I would be spending endless hours cutting and pasting and using the copy machine in order to get an edited version of what now can be simply done on the computer. Over in the Ways and Means Committee, AT&T computers are applied to spreadsheets. Uh, the other big item here is um, spending. Mm -hmm. The Ways and Means Committee is responsible for putting together uh, the budget for the House of Representatives. The budget consists of about 1,000 line items and totals around $12 billion. Our chief responsibility is to put together uh, the, a version for the House and then follow it through the whole legislative process. The budget is amended by the House, Senate, and Governor, resulting in a hard copy version. When I got here in 1985, basically the budget was put together manually. It was typed manually, and, and if you can believe it, all 1,000 line items had to be added up manually at the end. We used to often have 24-hour, around-the-clock sessions. 
While the computers and AT&T staff are now a common sight at the State House, it wasn't always so. There was a point in time when people were very nervous and very apprehensive about it, afraid almost that they would not be able to have the information readily accessible to them. I guess if there's a such thing as computer anxiety, I had it. And uh, I, I, I was very nervous about uh, the fact that we were having computers in here. We got everyone involved from product management, product marketing, tier two and tier three technical support, the services organization, the material distribution. It's been uh, a group of people working together uh, to make sure that everything was done properly and that the customer was happy. This building was built in the later 1800s, and in those years they weren't thinking too much of computers. These are some of the miles of cables that we had to run. And this is some of the ways we had to run them. They do business with people that they feel comfortable with. Get your keyboard. Oh, gee, thanks. When's the next trip? You know, waiting for the winter to go down to Florida. Where? I usually say, I'll probably go down to uh, Boca. Yeah. Well, I, I like it for, for constituent work. Uh, I can, uh, I have it set up so that I can just reach back, uh, pick up my phone, and as I'm, I'm here talking on the phone, I type right in into my computer, I uh, see my response here, and rather than go through the process of conveying it to a staff member and having it come back to me and then back out and maybe back in again, um, it's right here. It's actually developed into another problem. Now we've got people in the building literally screaming for more computers. Uh, they want more of the equipment. This is a tough customer. This customer is extremely demanding. AT&T people internally sometimes have gotten the message that we're not as good as we used to be and that's wrong. Uh, we are a good company, and the fact that we have automated this state, I think illustrates that uh, this tough customer thinks that we're darn good, and we, uh, we should believe what they tell us. Competition, strategy, the will to win. AT&T's primary focus is to be a winner in the marketplace. This July, over 100 AT&T employees confronted the competition in Des Moines, Iowa. They were met by corporate athletes from across the nation who had come to challenge AT&T's two-year reign over the National Corporate Track Championships. Would AT&T win under Iowa's sunny sky? What does it take to be a winner on and off the field? The one word that emerges is consistency. I have to have a lot of concentration and dedication. Teamwork is very important. Coach Lou Putnam carefully outlines the strategy to lead AT&T to victory. Let's go for three in a row. I think these corporate championships are important to the company because, first of all, we're uh, competing against other companies, large companies like General Electric, IBM, Texas Instruments, DEC, and we show ourselves as a fit competitive organization. We see a lot of things in terms of the commitment, the dedication, and I think even some of the individual courages of the people involved running these events. These are the very same criteria, very same characteristics that we need every day in the marketplace. I'm a data systems consultant, and there's certain things that I specialize at that I'm good at, but there are certain things that I'm weak at, and I rely on other people for, for those strengths. In a relay event, not unlike the strategic business unit, we have three, four, five people pulling together, working to win that individual event. However, that's not enough, because we have to win this thing for AT&T as a team. These athletes achieve a competitive edge that they take back to the job. When I first got into strap putting, I learned a lot of things about myself that I didn't know I had as far as strength. And in fact, uh, the type of customers I have to deal with every day are sometimes irate. And you have to maintain a certain composure uh, to deal with the customers because you represent AT&T. Uh, and to be able to come out here and throw a shot put eight pounds is a nice feeling. <laughs> Good feeling. <laughs> 
At age 52, Sammy White is still competing for AT&T. His consistency, his natural talent, and discipline have made Sammy a winner. Stride for stride off the turn, 100 meters to go. 314 three, the national mark, Sammy White. There is a pride that you have in yourself. It means you've got to practice over and over again, doing the same things virtually day after day after day, day in and day out. This requires di a discipline, and the discipline that you establish is the same kind of thing that we use on our, in our daily routine. It's important now for us to continue in our winning way. Uh, as a team, I think we've taken on the challenge. Strategy, training, and teamwork paid off for AT&T. These athletes know what it takes to win, and they approach their jobs with the same spirit and determination. AT&T, three years in a row, number one. Number one. Hi, I'm Chris Newton. I've been producing this show for the last couple of years. I'm here because I wanted to tell you in person that Directions will be discontinued as a regularly scheduled program, and to let you know why. It's not that you don't like the program. You send us thousands of these forms every edition, giving us your impressions, your opinions, and telling us what you'd like to see. And when you don't like something, you've told us so, so strongly that we knew you cared. So why are we discontinuing the series? Well, we just don't have enough viewers to justify the costs. Right now, we're only reaching a small percentage of AT&T people worldwide, and it doesn't look like we can gain many more without a huge investment in television distribution. So, Directions is being discontinued as a bi-monthly series. We expect we will continue to put out special programs from time to time when the need is there. Some of the efforts may even be under the Directions banner. One thing that's been great about producing Directions has been all of the feedback we've received from you. We never made everyone happy, but we always received a clear consensus on what your favorite story was. And it seemed like it was always a story that emphasized the contribution of the ordinary working people of this company. Let's look back on the top four stories of the last two years now. Hello. Hello, this is the yes. AT&T International Operator. Are you placing a call to Moscow? In the winter of 1988, we celebrated Glasnost with a story that remains unforgettable to many who saw it. An immigrant Russian family was trying to place a call home to Moscow on their parents' golden wedding anniversary, and we watched as an international operator patiently worked to get the call through. Hello, Moskwa. This yeah. is Pittsburgh. Thank you, dear. Mm -hmm. I've been trying so long to reach you. Hello. Hello, Eugenia. Yes. Hi. We finally have the operator in Moscow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Hello. 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 Papa. One of the reasons it feels so nice to be an operator, especially in the IOC, is because you're aware of the tension between a lot of the countries. And you know, you're dealing with customers of a different nationality, you're dealing with the operators in a in a country that may not be an ally of the United States. But when the three of you are all together, you know, you're working as a team. And it seems like all the problems that are in the world have disappeared, you know, for that brief moment. Operator Renee Ganster is still with the IOC. In October, her job became a little bit easier. Customers are now able to dial direct to large Soviet cities. In the wintertime, uh, travel time to the snowcat locations becomes very significant. Uh, oftentimes, in order to do a two-hour job, it requires six hours of travel. Hundreds of viewers wrote to ask about Ron Shields, the communications technician we profiled in July 1988. Ron was a respected technician, 
and his dilemma was typical of thousands of craft in rural locations across the country. As digital technology made the network more reliable, tending isolated repeater stations would be less and less necessary. Would he be forced to leave the New Mexico high country, or would he leave the company first? Here's how the piece ended. As for the future, uh, I, I see that the, the transition from analog to digital is probably a necessary step. But in the meantime, we still got to exist. In the real world, we're going to have another five years, at least, of a lot of analog radio systems. Ron still calls New Mexico home. He'll be riding herd on his repeater stations until mid-1991. We interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. The all-time favorite story for many viewers remains the War of the Worlds. Have you seen any Martians? To recognize the 50th anniversary of Orson Welles' famous radio broadcast, we tracked down five operators who had been working the boards on that fateful night. We brought them into the studio and got them to reminisce. And I think of the ones who were begging us to get connections to their families, to their husbands, to mothers and fathers before the world came to an end so they could just tell them they loved them. You see, it was not a case of answering a light and connecting them to somebody else. All they wanted was the operator. I was just so concerned that I was going to help, be able to help all these people. And never Their dedication and pride in service and struck a chord with our viewers. Because I believe part of it was, with the old telephone company uh, training, you are very dedicated to your job. You stay there through thick or thin. Today, all of our former operators continue to enjoy both retirement and their special place in telecommunications history. It's December of 1988, and in the Soviet Republic of Armenia, a massive earthquake has caused widespread destruction. In January, we received word that three technicians based in Holland had been sent to the city of Lenina Khan to help restore telecommunications. Somehow, we managed to get a cameraman to the site, and he spent several days documenting their lives, their feelings, their frustrations. There will be no maps, no circuit diagrams of how it is, how it is fixed, how it is mounted, which cable are going to what. Well, there's only one thing, throw it away. Build a new one. It's such a crazy thing. We don't have cables where subscribers are, are, are connected to. We have no cables at all. We have nothing. Just a working exchange. It's, uh, it, it doesn't go so quick. But people thought in Holland, well, we put the exchange there, and within a couple of days, we can establish more or less normal telecommunication. But it, it's not the way it works here. It, it goes slower. It goes slower, so, uh, so next week we are going home, leaving behind the working exchange with no subscribers. And that's a little st strange feeling for me. Even today, over six months later, only 100 subscribers are connected to the exchange. Dick von Vilpen is currently working in Saudi Arabia, while Aldo Filapi and Jacques van der Svalu have returned to their jobs in Holland. Last June, the three were awarded the recognition of excellence by the management board of AT&T. Aldo, Dick, and Jack are like AT&T people everywhere. They had the spirit of adventure that says, yes, I'll go, choose me. They had the courage to head into the unknown, and they persevered to overcome a tough situation and get the job done right. We've believed in that spirit and tried to show it in every edition of Directions. If you've been watching for years, Thanks for your loyalty. If you've only just discovered us, we're sorry we won't be here to show you around AT&T on a regular basis. To all of you, thanks for watching.